Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Listen, I was outside doing a live video and the internet connection lost. So I wasn't going to use the whiteboard. So I thought, man, I better go inside. And turn. we're talking about the wheat and the tear. How can you tell which you are? The reason Jesus used that analogy is because they're very difficult, the wheat and the tear, they grow up together, they're difficult to distinguish one from the other. And here's the thing, the tares are in the children of Satan, that's people. The wheat are the children of God, and they intermingle. They intermingle, so it's hard to distinguish, and they grow up together. And so Jesus is talking about the kingdom. Now, I drew this line on top real fast. I'm going to do some drawing on here so you can understand. And what I want to get to by the end of this message is how you can tell whether you're wheat or tear. I am certain, without a doubt, because I talk to a lot of people about the gospel, that there are a lot of people listening to this that think they're saved, but they're not. They have been deceived by the counterfeit master deceiver, Satan himself. He knows how to do it. He's really good at it. He's been doing it for thousands of years. He gets people to believe a lie, whether it's in the disguise of religion, morality, going to church, denominations, giving uh, money, doing benevolent work. He has a lot of ways of getting you to believe that you're saved when you, in fact, you are not. Here's the danger of this is if at the end of the age, as we're going to read here, when the angels come to separate the wheat and the tare, if you're not in the right family, you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. I didn't say that. God did. Okay, so let me read to you this passage. But first of all, let me kind of bring you up to date. Okay. This is in the OT, Old Testament time. Okay, can you see that? Old Testament. And, and, and the Jewish, the Hebrews, had an idea that the Messiah was going to come as a king. Okay? So when Jesus came on the scene, when he was born, when he was born, when he came on the scene, and then he began to do his public ministry at the age of 30, he was born of a servant. He didn't come as a king. And so the nation of Israel, especially the religious leaders, they rejected him. No matter what Jesus would do, he showed that through his genealogy, he was a rightful heir to his mother and father. He demonstrated miracles that nobody had ever done before. But yet they still attacked him. Even when he healed on the Sabbath, when he taught on the Sabbath, they, they ran him down. They put the Sabbath over more than what even God does. And they did all kinds of things to reject him. But the last thing they did, as Jesus was trying to present his kingdom to them, was Jesus had done a healing and they said to him, you can only do this because you're empowered by the devil himself under Beelzebub. When that happened, God had enough. And at that point, right there, you have the coming of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ. At this point here, you have rejection. He begins to talk about his kingdom. And he's going to do this with parables because he doesn't want these people to know what he is talking about. But he does want the disciples to know. So he's going to use parables to hide truth from the unbelieving and to reveal mysteries to those that are believing. Okay, the first advent is called a parousia. 
It's the first coming. Okay, that happened here. The acceptance. What happened at the second coming? When he comes. Between this period of time, we have what's called the inter-advent period. The mystery. The mysteries of the kingdom. And Jesus uses a series of parables to explain these things to the disciples. Okay, so let me real quickly talk to you about the parable of the wheat and tares. Okay, let me read it for you first. In some parables, he doesn't give an explanation. This one he will. Okay, he's going to share the parable with the multitude. He's then going to go with the disciples alone. And while he's alone, the disciples are going to ask him the meaning of the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he's going to explain it to them. So let me read it to you real quick because it's really important that at the end you can tell which you are. There are a lot of counterfeits up there, a lot of people that are going to hell that think they shouldn't be. But they will because they got misled. Okay, let me read this to you. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in this field. Okay, so this is the field. And he's sowing all this good seed in his field. Okay? He says, but while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the enemy came, he came and he sowed weeds all among good one. All over. Okay. When the weeds brought it and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Now the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Because there were, what's all these bad seeds in here? Where did the weeds come from? Jesus said, an enemy did this. So the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? Can you imagine trying to pull all those up? It's going to get better. <laughs> No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. So in other words, while you're pulling out all those weeds, you may end up pulling, pulling the ones that I sowed. Don't do it. Let them grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvester, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Okay, so... They're going to go to two different places. One to barn. One into the barn. And another one into the fire. The good seeds, the wheat, go here. The tar, the tares go into the fire. Okay. Now, the meaning of the parable. When the crowd left, he went into a house with his disciples, and the disciples came to him, and they said to Jesus, Can you explain the parable of the weeds in the field? And he answered, The one who sowed the good seeds is the Son of Man. In other words, the one who sowed these seeds was Jesus. Okay, all of these were sown by Jesus. The field is the world. That's, that's, that's this, it's the world. And he says, 
the field is the world, and the good seeds stand for the sons, sons of the kingdom, and the weeds are the sons of the evil one. Don't miss that. These are the sons of the kingdom. And these are the sons of the devil. And so on. Two families. Two families coexisting in the world which are not very distinguishable. Don't miss that. It's very, very important. Okay? He says, he says, the weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. So he's identified. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. So the one that's going to separate these are angels. They're the ones that are going to go in here and they're going to separate. The angels are going to take all the ones and put them in the barn and they're going to take all the bad ones to throw them in the fire. Okay? I love diagramming on whiteboards. I especially like if there were people here we could start having a discussion. Manny, what about this? I said, well, you know, that's a good thought. Let's think about that, okay? <laughs> I love to teach. I especially love to teach when lights come on. <gasps> oh, wow. You can tell uh, when I used to in some classes, you hear that, mm, mm, mm. That means they got it. <laughs> Something, they got illuminated in their mind and heart. Oh, oh, that makes sense. Okay. The, the weeds are the sons of the evil, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest at the end of the age, the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay. Here's the message. Here's what I want you to think about. How can you tell which one you are if they're not distinguishable? He told the disciples, I don't want you to go and pull them up. You may end up pulling up the good ones. So a couple of things. One, you've got to learn how to live in this world with evil people. How do you do that? Okay, second of all, if you don't pull them up, how do you recognize them? You mean to tell me they're in your church? Yes. In your schools? Yes. In your family? Probably. How can you tell if someone else is a terror wheat? How can you tell if you're terror wheat? I'm going to tell you how. Although I shouldn't. I should make you tell me how. Let me blow your mind. You can always tell your wheat if. You recognize within yourself how sinful you are and how holy God is. And there's an increasing awareness of that as you grow in the Christian life. It's an inward change that happens within. Not only that, but you find inside of yourself this unsatisfiable desire to spend time in the milk and meat of his word so you can be nourished. You also find within yourself this desire to communicate 
rarely with God. Not on formal prayers or in a particular building, but you just have that desire to communicate with God. And you worship Him 24-7, not in the location or in a particular building, playing silly rap songs or 7-Eleven music. You find within yourself the ability to sing a new song in your heart to the Lord who has done so much for you. Okay? You also have a desire to want to spend time with spiritually minded, godly, theologically sound believers, other like-minded disciples. Notice, I didn't say anything about giving money, about going to church. I didn't say anything about being more morally upright. Not that those things are bad, but that's not how you distinguish yourself. I know as I've been a Christian now, golly, 40, 50 years, that each day I see myself more and more sinful. And each day I see God more and more holy. And the next thing that you're able to recognize whether you're weak is because you have learned and you know how to appropriate the grace of God. Other ways of knowing is because whom God loves, he disciplines. Like a father does his child, but he does it for our good. He's the master, what? Potter, we're the clay. He disciplines us and brings trials our way all the time. An increasing manner and longer manners. It is in nothing like these health and wealth prosperity teachers proclaim. That's how you can know your wheat. You have an interest in other people, not just in yourself. Recently, somebody, uh, a gal posted on Facebook. She said, where can I find a Christian mate on, on what's the best uh, uh, internet site, uh, dating site to find someone? And I wanted to say, you know, the best one is in heaven. <laughs> Don't even think about getting in a relationship unless you're willing to do three things. First of all, you're willing to love somebody the way God has loved you and forgive you, forgive them the way God has forgiven you continuously, no matter what they've done. How many women leave because their husband did something or their wife did something? Second of all, that you recognize that God brings you together to reflect who he is in oneness, not in divorce. That doesn't reflect God. It gives a poor image to the world of what God is. Third all, is that you're ready to be in a relationship to allow God to lead you according to his appointed roles and authority. Don't even think about it. That's one way how you can tell whether you're weak. If you're not willing to do those things, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, you're probably terror. And at the end of time, you're going to be wishing you had more than just a relationship with somebody. You're going to wish you had a relationship with God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, they're not distinguishable. I don't know how many people I've rubbed shoulders with thinking they're believers only to find out that they were not. You know? But you have this inner relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that shows that you have a new nature. Behold, old things have passed, new things have come. I've been transformed from the domain of darkness, from darkness to light, which is what he says is going to happen when we go into God's barn. For some reason, God wanted me to do it this way. I don't know. Listen, share this with other people. I'm certain you're going to rub shoulders today, this week, this month, this year, with a lot of unbelievers that think they are believers. 
Ask them how they know and see if they reflect or say any of the things I said about a changed nature and a changed heart and a changed receptivity and a, and a changed level of spirituality. And they begin to see things as God sees them with a great amount of wisdom and discernment. If those things aren't there and they're just doing the same old things, they may have gotten more religious, more moral, but you can't rehabilitate that which is not habilitatable. You can't rehabilitate the old nature. It's rooted in Satan. There's only two families. Which family are you in? There are two families. There's no universal, everybody's saved and everybody's going to heaven. That doesn't exist. God said it. Jesus, right here in Matthew 13, they're sons of the devil and they're sons of God. Which one are you? This is something to think about. God bless you all. Have a good day.